The Raw Bowl match features four tag teams, the Smoking Guns, Yokozuna and Owen Hart, Razor Ramon and Savio Vega, and finally Sid and the Kid. This is an elimination match, any wrestler can get tagged in at any time, physical contact has to be made with an opponent before tagging out, so for example if Sid and the Kid both get tagged in, they have to wrestle each other before tagging out. And finally, a team can call one timeout at any point in the match. During the entrances, Razor Ramon was presented with some gold roses sent by Goldust. The bad guy took it out on Goldust's little servant as the bizarre one looked on. The Raw Bowl starts off with Owen Hart and Bart Gunn. The rule about potentially wrestling your own tag team partner is used nearly straight away when Owen tags in Billy Gunn, but Billy and Bart do a quick hip toss spot that leads to a fake out. The Smoking Guns then tag in Owen Hart and Yoko Zuna. The King of Hearts is hesitant to go at it with Yoko, the two men get in the ring and Yoko Zuna hits Owen with a giant shoulder block, Owen tags in Savio Vega, Yoko Zuna tags in the kid, and so far the action has been quite fast paced. Razor Ramon and Owen Hart get a chance to do some work in the ring but there isn't enough time for things to settle. It's quick tag after quick tag followed by explosive offense to start things off here on Raw. Bart Gunn hits an impressive vertical suplex on Psycho Sid before tagging Owen back into the match. We go to commercial break as Yokozuna is doing a number on Savio Vega and when we return, Yokozuna has forgotten how to wear a t-shirt it seems. I'm finding it very hard to say much about the match so far, it's following the form formula of tag, wrestle for 20 seconds, tag, wrestle for another 20 seconds, rinse and repeat. Things finally heat up a little when Razor tags in to face the 123 kid. The bad guy hits a fall away slam which leads to the kid calling a timeout. The bad guy hits the razor's edge anyway, which you'd think would lead to a disqualification, but no. Ted DiBiase distracts the referee, Sid hits Razor from behind with a clothesline, the 1-2-3 kid makes the cover and Razor Ramon and Savio Vega get eliminated from the match. We come back from the second commercial break and the match finally gets a chance to slow down a little. Owen Hart and Bart Gunn have a nice offensive exchange. I like this spot here where Yokozuna accidentally hits the bonsai drop on his own tag team partner, leading to Owen getting pinned even when Yokozuna tried to call for a timeout. So we're down to Sid and the Kid and the Smoking Guns, the heels do well here in breaking the rules and distracting the referee, Sid in particular looked pretty good during certain spots as Billy and Bart took a beating in the ring. The match comes to an end when Razor Ramon interferes pushing the 1-2-3 Kid off the top rope and on the psycho Sid, Billy rushes over to get the pinfall win, and yeah the Raw Bowl is over. I've really mixed feelings about this match, I feel it would have been better to see it live in the arena thanks to how fast paced it was but on TV it came across as a little messy. It also took up over half of the Raw broadcast meaning this whole Raw Bowl matchup is going head to head with two Nitro bouts along with a promo. Following the Goldust match we see clips of a Royal Rumble press conference where Shawn Michaels announces he will take part in the 1996 Royal Rumble. The WWF were now hoping all those sympathy inducing promos were going to pay off. We also get some words from Razor Ramon, Diesel and Owen Hart in regards to Shawn's return. Diesel says that HBK is still his friend but he won't hesitate to eliminate Shawn from the Royal Rumble match. Flipping over to Raw, Goldust is in the ring, the bizarre one begins feeling up Vince McMahon before asking the owner of the WWF if that's an extra microphone in his pocket or is he just happy to see Goldust. Jerry Lawler is dying with laughter as Vince questions Goldust about Goldust's feelings towards Razor Ramon. Are they real feelings or is this all just mind games that will eventually lead to the Intercontinental Championship? Goldust says there's many men out there but he's very select and Goldust wants Razor Ramon badly, more than any man or woman could want a human being. Goldust says that Razor will never forget his name as Vince McMahon looks on in disgust. We go over to Doc Hendricks and Doc says Razor is entering the building. After the commercial break, Razor Ramon makes an appearance. He asks Doc where is Goldust and Doc snitches and tells the bad guy he's in the locker room. Yeah, segment over and it's a point for Raw. Whether Goldust was your thing or or not, you can't say that his promos weren't effective, especially during this time period. This was the first one that really kicked it into another gear. 
To end this broadcast of Raw, Goldust takes an absolute kicking backstage from Razor Ramon during the Bizarre One's planned interview with Doc Hendricks. Goldust buys himself a little time by delivering a low blow and running away from Razor, but he's attacked again when he tries to grab his coat. The fight spills out to the streets and Goldust is eventually able to get away in his car. Clearly, the bad guy didn't share the same love that Goldust had for him. The bizarre Goldust was able to defeat Razor Ramon to become the new Intercontinental Champion due to the 1-2-3 Kids interference. The man of a thousand holds, Dean Malenko, takes on Brian Pullman next on Nitro, while the former Intercontinental Champion Razor Ramon does battle with Hunter Hearst Helmsley on Raw. As the Raw match gets underway, we see Ted DiBiase and the Kid via split screen, calling Razor Ramon a crybaby before producing a baby's bottle and a diaper from nowhere. Back in the ring, Vince McMahon says he never heard Razor Ramon crying about losing the IC title, and yeah, Razor didn't cry about it, so this whole angle the WWF were starting here which would lead to a crybaby match did feel like it was plucked from thin air but anyway hunter is trying to apply a wrist lock in the ring but razor stops that by punching helmsley in the mouth things start off in a rather typical manner razor stays on the attack while shutting down any attempts hunter makes at building offense of his own when we come back from commercials razor gets crotched on the top rope while helmsley's valet looks on hunter is now firmly in control as razor gives helmsley a lot of time on the attack. Jerry Lawler is trying to get a word with Hunter's valet as the blue blood continues to destroy Ramon in the ring. You get the feeling that Razor was bumping a lot here because Hunter was his buddy. We didn't really see Razor going for long periods without offense, especially on Monday Night Raw, but here Hunter is coming across more vicious and more capable than ever. The 1-2-3 kid makes an appearance, shoving the baby bottle in Razor's mouth. This leads to Razor chasing kid around the ring and Hunter wins via countout. The kid escapes, the bad guy tries to deliver the razor's edge on Hunter but he can't nail it. Hunter gets out of dodge with his valet and the match is over. One Man Gang vs Hulk Hogan is next on Nitro while WWF Champion Bret Hart battles IC Champion Goldust on Raw. Before the main event, it's announced that Diesel will battle Davy Boy Smith next week on Raw while Shawn Michaels meets Yokozuna one on one. Goldust makes his way to the ring with Marlena. Marlena made her debut at the Raw Rumble and at this point in time, Marlena was referred to as Goldust's director. Bret gets a great ovation on his way to the ring. McMahon and Lawler say that Bret Hart suffered a knee injury last night at the Raw Rumble and it also looks like Bret Hart has a black eye due to his match with The Undertaker. As both men begin circling the ring, McMahon announces that Bret Hart will defend the WWF title against Big Daddy Cool Diesel inside a steel cage at In Your House 6. I'll cover that event when the time comes. Goldust and the Hitman lock up and just as Bret brings Goldust to the corner, we go to commercial break so we miss the complete start of this match unfortunately. When we come back, Goldust fights his way out of a hammerlock and he brings the offense to Brett in the corner. Goldust begins targeting Brett's arm, bringing the hitman down to the mat, but Brett is able to launch Goldust out of the ring. Things get a little silly when Raw goes to another commercial break. There was about a minute of action here in between commercials and it seriously hurts the flow of this match. When we come back for the second time, Goldust once again has the upper hand. Brett has to fight his way out of a wrist lock this time and I couldn't help but notice that referee Tim White is seriously distracted by something here. He shouting Brett's name and trying to give a cue while looking straight at the entranceway. Brett again throws Goldust out of the ring. Goldust and Marlena look like they have had enough, but Razor Ramon greets Goldust at the entranceway, tossing Goldust back into the ring as Bret Hart gives a thumbs up to the bad guy. Another commercial break, that's three in one match, and when we come back, Brett hits a second rope clothesline, a Russian leg sweep, sharpshooter and it's all over. Way to bury your new intercontinental champion also here Vince. I had really high hopes for this one and I did say I wouldn't complain about commercial breaks because it's simply an unavoidable reality of weekly television wrestling shows but it's hard to ignore three commercial breaks in one main event. You don't get a chance to settle in for the bout at all and it's also quite shocking that Goldust would get beaten so soundly after just winning the IC title. So let's take a quick look at the In Your House 6 results taking place in Louisville, Kentucky. Razor Ramon defeated the 1-2-3 Kid in their crybaby match. Sean Waltman ended up getting put in a diaper after the final bell, but still it was a solid match. 
It seems like forever since we got to see a match on Raw, so I'm looking forward to this one. The bad guy Razor Ramon getting his IC title rematch against Goldust. It's quite interesting going back and watching Goldust's earlier entrances. Things were a lot more elaborate with the bizarre one, and it's also fascinating to see how quickly the WWF would begin altering the character. Anyway, just like Hulk Hogan, Razor isn't giving Goldust a chance to get his entrance gear off. The bad guy is giving Goldust a beating as feathers fly all over the ring. Goldust gets clotheslined over the top rope and yeah you can tell Scott Hall wasn't keen on working with Dustin Runnels here. It kind of reminds me of the Dean Douglas stuff. Goldust gets back in the ring and Razor spits on his opponent. The bad guy begins wrenching Goldust's arm while slapping his face and Razor slams Goldust to the mat while still applying the wrench. A reversal spot is then botched, not sure what was going on here, and Goldust is able to reverse the Razor's edge by sending Ramon over the top rope. We come back from commercials and Goldust is in control. Razor finds himself in a sleeper but a reversal sees the bad guy applying a sleeper of his own. Goldust gets out with a jawbreaker but the momentum doesn't last long as Razor stops Goldust from going to the top rope. A superplex follows and then we see a great spot where Razor delivers his signature fall away slam to Goldust over the top rope. I thought this looked awesome even though we didn't see the full impact. Razor brings Goldust back into the ring. The bizarre one gets hit with a side suplex from the top rope and afterwards Goldust just says nope and he leaves the ring. Razor Ramon wins via countout. Another poor finish here. Razor grabs the mic afterwards and the bad guy says he doesn't want the IC belt. He wants the ass of gold dust. Careful what you wish for, Razor. Ramon says he's heard that Roddy Piper is back in the World Wrestling Federation and the new WWF president is the man who can make matches. The bad guy says that Roddy Piper has kids just like Razor Ramon and Razor says he doesn't want his kids watching guys like Goldust on TV. So Razor challenges Roddy Piper to make the match. Razor Ramon vs Goldust at WrestleMania. Of course this match wouldn't happen. Roddy Piper did indeed book the Miami Alley fight between Razor Ramon and Goldust the next night at the Superstars taping, but Razor would soon get suspended for failing a wellness test. Ramon was left off the WrestleMania card and the bad guy would use this time to finalise his arrival to WCW. Those who want to see the NWO on Reliving the War, it's coming very soon. A point for Raw by the way, not a great finish here from the WWF match but leagues better than Anderson vs Hogan. Vader destroyed Razor Ramon in the next match. This was Scott Hall's final live WWF television appearance. The bad guy was getting ready to change the face of wrestling over on WCW in a few months time. We then have another match inside the ring, it's the Mauler vs Steve Dahl. Steve Dahl you may remember better as Stephen Dunn from the well done tag team in the WWF and the Mauler is better known by his real name, Mike Enos. He was also known as Blake Beverly during his days in the WWF as one half of the Beverly brothers. But I know you don't care about that, you care about the guy who showed up from the audience to interrupt this match. The crowd is absolutely stunned as the WWF WWF's Razor Ramon shows up on Monday Nitro. Razor asks for a microphone, the match stops dead, and the bad guy gets in the ring to cut one of the most important promos of the Monday Night War. Razor Ramon isn't given a name, he isn't referred to as Razor by the commentary team, he isn't even called Scott Hall. As far as we know, this is the World Wrestling Federation's Razor Ramon interrupting a WCW event, and this is exactly what Eric Bischoff was trying to portray. Scott Hall had, in reality, signed with World Championship Wrestling, but he played the role of a WWF invader and he also played the role of Razor Ramon without being called Razor Ramon. This would be something WCW would be forced to legally clear up in the weeks that followed. Anyway, Hall says, Hey, you people, you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. Where is Billionaire Ted? Where is the Nacho Man? That punk can't even get in the building. Me, I go wherever I want, whenever I want. And where oh where is Scheme Jean? Cause I got a scoop for you. When that Ken doll lookalike, when that weatherman wannabe comes out here later tonight, I got a challenge for him, for Billionaire Ted, for the Nacho Man, and for anybody else in WCW. You, you wanna, wanna go, go to, to war? war? You want a war? You're gonna get one. 
Scott Hall was using the derogatory names for Ted Turner, Mean Gene Okerlund and Randy Savage that the WWF made up during their old billionaire Ted skits. This again was to try and show that Scott was a WWF guy trying to start a fight with WCW. Hall had also said he had a challenge for Eric Bischoff later in the show. Zabisco and Shivani are completely lost for words as Hall leaves the ringside area. The audience try to process what they just saw as evidenced by the strange hush inside the arena. This was pulled off so well. Razor Ramon was one of the most popular stars the WWF had. It would have been so easy to have Hall return to WCW with a pay-per-view match and book him as a standard babyface, but Bischoff gambled on this invasion storyline and already it seemed way more interesting than anything the WWF had going on. I mean, do you want to watch Diana Hart getting restraining orders against Shawn Michaels, or do you want to see a WWF guy declaring war on the opposing channel. Absolutely brilliant work here from WCW. Over on Nitro, Eric Bischoff is wrapping the show up when Scott Hall comes back. Hall says, we are taking over. Eric asks Scott, who is he referring to? And Hall says, you know who. Scott then tells Eric to go back to Ted Turner and get his three best guys. Scott says a war is coming to WCW but it won't happen on the microphone, it won't happen in the dirt sheets, it'll happen in the ring where it matters. Scott says that he and whoever he represents is coming down to WCW and like it or not they are taking over the company. So Hall has let out a challenge, a three on three challenge but we didn't know who else Scott was bringing with him and we didn't know if WCW would even accept the match. Eric Bischoff's reactions afterwards were absolutely fantastic. He looks embarrassed, he looks lost for words and he looks a little scared. It's another point for Nitro. Vince McMahon then addresses Scott Hall's departure while also spoiling the upcoming debut of Kevin Nash in WCW when he says this on commentary. No longer associated with the WWF in any manner are Big Daddy Cool Diesel and the bad guy Razor Ramon. It's been reported that these two individuals intend to pawn themselves off as the stars they once were here in the WWF and furthermore perpetuate some ruse that they still represent the World Wrestling Federation while actually under contract to a rival organisation. So Vince McMahon was telling everyone here that Scott Hall was not the WWF invader that he portrayed on Nitro, while also letting everyone know that Diesel would be showing up over on TNT very soon. This probably backfired. If a big WWF fan heard this without knowing what was going on over in WCW, they'd probably be inclined to switch over to Nitro just to see what was happening. We have a special appearance over at the commentary table. Out comes Razor Ramon. Scott Hall says he had so much fun last week that he's came back for more. Bischoff tries to leave, but Hall says Eric Bischoff started this war, and Razor says we are going to finish it. Before Hall can say who we are, the Stinger shows up to defend WCW. Sting offers Hall a fight right there and then, and Hall says that nobody tells him what to do. Hall throws his toothpick at Sting, and Sting replies with a slap to the face. Now completely fired up, Scott Hall says he has a big surprise for Sting in WCW next week as Nitro goes off the air. Eric Bischoff and Bobby Heenan begin wrapping up the show and then Bobby Heenan runs away when Scott Hall shows up. Bischoff is a little more confident than usual. Eric wants to know who this big surprise is or what this big surprise is. And then Big Daddy Cool Diesel shows up. Kevin Nash says that Eric Bischoff has been out here running his mouth ever since the inception of Monday Nitro. And then he says it. This is where the big boys play, huh? Look at the adjective, play. Look at the adjective, look at, look at the adjective, look at the adjective, play. Okay, that's that taken care of. Big Nash says that he's the big surprise and Kevin wants to know where's WCW's three guys. Nash calls Nitro boring while mocking the main eventers of World Championship Wrestling, saying that Eric can't get guys off dialysis machines in order to come out and face this new threat. 
Nash asks, where is Hulk Hogan and where is the Macho Man? Are they gone making episodes of Blunder in Paradise and Slim Jim commercials instead of standing up for WCW? Eric has lost all that confidence he had moments ago when he tells Kevin Nash and Scott Hall that he's going to meet with WCW executives and he's going to try and get three guys together for a match. Eric then totally screws his audience by implying that the match will take place at the Great American Bash. Eric says, I'll be in the offices of WCW and I'll try to get you your fight. You know what? Live this Sunday in Baltimore, the Great American Bash. You guys want to show up? You want to fight? You show up and I'll see if I can get you your fight. Hull and Nash say that people love them in Baltimore and the two men agree to show up. Kevin Nash says that the measuring stick has changed in WCW before the show goes off the air. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were then interviewed by Eric Bischoff. Hall and Nash were forced to admit that they do not work for the WWF at the beginning of the promo. The WWF had legitimately begun legal proceedings against WCW for trademark infringement, defamation, slander and unfair competition. The WWF felt that Nash and Hall were using characters that the WWF created in WCW. The World Wrestling Federation owned the Razor Ramon and Diesel characters and so Nash and Hall had to stop acting like Razor Ramon and Diesel. Eric got Hall and Nash to say on pay-per-view, not on TV, on pay-per-view where there would be less people watching, that they did not work for the WWF and this was done to show the courts that this storyline had apparently nothing to do with the World Wrestling Federation but you can see what they were playing at here. Bischoff tells Hall and Nash that they have their match. It's going to take place at Batch at the Beach in Daytona and it's going to be a three on three match. Hall and Nash say they have another guy waiting and the outsiders want to know who they're going to face at the pay-per-view. When Bischoff doesn't answer, he gets powerbombed from the stage through a table. We come back from commercial break and Sting is still getting hammered. The crowd again chant we want flair, but it looks like the nature boy isn't hitting the ring tonight. Harlem Hater double teaming Sting and Lex needs tagged in, or either Steiner brother to be fair. Booker T gets back in the match, he misses a top rope splash and the Stinger manages to tag in the total package. As Luger begins cleaning house, the camera zooms out and the outsiders show up from the audience. As Hall and Nash approach the ring holding baseball bats, a bunch of cops storm the ring and in the middle of the commotion, Harlem Heat win the tag team titles. A diesel chant breaks out as Hall and Nash stay on the outside of the ring threatening to attack at any moment. What you have to consider here is how bad this made WCW look in a way. The Outsiders were able to hold off 6 WCW superstars and their police protection. What hope did WCW really have if they looked this afraid of the Outsiders? Anyway, it's a great ending to Nitro this week. Hall and Nash walk away slowly while Bobby Heenan shows a lot of concern at the commentary table. The Outsiders have shown up on Monday Night Row and they've bought tickets to sit in the arena. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall have even brought some snacks and Kevin tells Doug Dillinger that they're there to see the big boys of WCW. Bobby Heenan is on edge but Bischoff reminds his broadcast partner that Sting, Luger and Savage are all in the building but the commentators are still concerned about this mystery third man. A Rey Mysterio highlight reel begins playing on Nitro but the video gets cut off. The outsiders are moving around in the crowd and they have a live microphone. Nash says that the takeover is happening a little early and Scott Hall says look Donny Osmond has come back in regards to Eric Bischoff. The outsiders try to approach the announce desk but security rushes in and Hall and Nash are kept at bay. Luger, Sting and Savage show up and the outsiders laugh at their face paint. Within moments, the whole WCW locker room comes out to get the outsiders out of the building. This was some great stuff. Rivalries had been thrown out the window. Heels and baby faces of WCW are standing together to get these two out of the building. Bischoff and Heenan look concerned as Nash and Hall continue to taunt the whole WCW roster. 
The crowd begin chanting Diesel as Hall and Nash leave. Heenan says the outsiders may be gone, but what about the third guy? He could be anywhere right now. And Eric Bischoff reiterates the fact that Team WCW is ready for Batch at the Beach. Again, good stuff here. The use of different camera angles and everyone banding together really made this feel different. You have to give it to Bischoff and WCW for trying this, and really, they are totally knocking it out of the park. Nitro ends with Bischoff and Heenan wondering why the third man hasn't been announced yet, and Bischoff gets word that there's some commotion outside. Security are removing the outsiders from the building and Nash and Hall are resisting. The show comes to an end with the outsiders getting brought to their car, and Kevin Nash and Scott Hall say they'll see us in Daytona before driving off into the night. And then it was time for the hostile takeover match. Nash, Hall and the mystery third man against Lex Luger, Sting and Randy Savage. Mean Gene interviewed the outsiders at the beginning of the match trying to find some answers about the third man, but Hall and Nash said they have enough right now to take care of business. The outsiders wrestled this match without the third man, but Lex Luger was also taken out pretty early on, so essentially it's a normal 2 on 2 tag team match. Nash hits a low blow when Savage signals for the elbow drop, and then Hulk Hogan comes to the ring. It looked like Hogan was there to help his old friend Randy Savage, but Hogan hits the Macho Man with a leg drop as Bobby Heenan screams that Hulk Hogan is the third man. More leg drops follow and fans witness something they thought they had never see. Hulk Hogan just turned heel and it was an absolutely brilliant move. You guys know by watching this show every week that Hogan had become incredibly stale. This move right here gave Hogan's career a real shot in the arm. As fans throw garbage into the ring, Mean Gene gets an interview with the Hulkster, and Hulk says he got bored with WCW. Hogan says for two years he held his head high, and he done a lot of work for kids and charities, but because of the reactions Hogan had gotten from WCW fans, he decided to go to the dark side. The Hulkster says Hall and Nash are the future, Hall and Nash are the new blood, and the new world organization is taking over. Yeah, he forgot the name of the faction here. So it all changes from this point. The NWO are now part of WCW programming, and the rivalry between NWO and WCW would take center stage for the foreseeable future. Sting looks pretty dejected after last night's pay-per-view. He gets in the ring and Arn Anderson tries to shake his hand, but Sting won't do it. He's had too much history with the horseman just to forgive everything due to what happened at Bash at the Beach. Sting does give a clean break in the corner after the initial lockup though, and afterwards the Stinger takes Anderson down with a shoulder block. Eric Bischoff then announces that we have company. The outsiders have shown up and Bischoff wants to wait it out to see what happens. Sting and Double A trade hammer locks before Arn throws his opponent out of the ring. Arn then goes for a pile driver on the outside, but Sting reverses with a backdrop. Sting allows Arn to get back in the ring as we take a commercial break. When we come back, Sting is in control. From out of nowhere, Double A fires back with his signature spine buster, but the enforcer can't follow up. Bischoff says that a black limousine has just pulled up to the MGM Studios entranceway. And Eric says there's too many kids here and not enough security. <laughs> what did he really think the NWO were going to do here? Arn is giving his opponent a beating now as a Sting chant breaks out in the audience. Any goodwill between Sting and Anderson seems to be thrown out the window as Arn applies an abdominal stretch. The enforcer cheats by using the ropes for leverage. Sting gets out and he goes for a splash, but Arn gets the knees up. Arn is then able to apply a Boston Crab, and then we see the limousine sitting by the MGM Studios entranceway. Arn chokes Sting on the middle rope, and Double A goes upstairs. Sting manages to hit a jumping clothesline to stop Double A in his tracks, and then we see the outsiders walking towards the ring. Once Hall and Nash get the ringside, the action completely stops as both Sting and Double A invite the outsiders in for a fight. Even the macho man Randy Savage shows up. Double A then tries to go for a cheap victory, but Sting applies the deathlock and it's all over. Sting wins via submission. 
Mean Gene interviews Sting afterwards and Sting says he isn't surprised at what Hogan did last night. When Sting and Savage were travelling on the road, Hogan travelled alone in his limo and Hogan disappeared time and time again to make movies. Sting says that Hogan just made cameo appearances during his time in WCW, but what he did at Bash at the Beach was a mistake. Kids had looked up to Hogan and Hogan told those fans to stick it last night, but Sting tells Hogan that he can stick it. Savage also sends a message to Hulk. The Macho Man tells Hulk to think about the worst thing he can possibly dream of, multiply it by 9 million, and then multiply that by infinity and beyond. Savage must have been having too much fun at Disney here. Over on Nitro, Mean Gene interviews Hall and Nash and Gene wants to talk about Hogan's heel turn. Nash says WCW took a beating last night and the fans of WCW took a beating because Hulk Hogan told them exactly how it was. Nash says that Hogan built wrestling, WCW fans couldn't appreciate that but the outsiders do. Nash announces that Hogan will be on Nitro next week and Scott Hall says the Outsiders did exactly as they promised. They announced their third partner and they beat WCW at Bash at the Beach. Hall says Randy Savage is jealous of Hulk Hogan and Lex Luger didn't get hurt last night, he just fainted when he saw the Outsiders in the ring. The final point goes to Raw, Cornette losing his mind has so much replayability and the Outsiders really didn't say much except that Hogan will be on Nitro next week. As Eric Bischoff and Bobby Heenan welcome us to Hour 2 of WCW Nitro, we see the Outsiders standing on top of the Disney MGM Studios entranceway and they're placing NWO banners over the WCW lettering. Bischoff though wants to know where Hulk Hogan is. The cameras pan out to show the NWO banners as the Disney fireworks go off in the background. So we actually have convenient fireworks this week. Good job Mickey Mouse. Just before we go to commercial break, we see the outsiders watching the action from top of the MGM Studios entranceway. And our man Kevin Nash here is enjoying a sweet cocktail. Bischoff reminds us that Hogan and the Outsiders are yet to show up on Nitro as Big Bubba and Lex Luger make their way to the ring. I guess Lex Luger is now a full blown babyface, remember he was doing all that sneaky shit just before Scott Hall showed up, but now it looks like the total package is a stand up guy. Big Bubba starts off with the upper hand but it doesn't take long for Luger to turn things around, knocking Bubba out of the ring and getting a good crowd response at the same time. Bubba gets a little support from Jimmy Hart before Lex takes control of the arm. Lex is able to hit a forearm smash but it only gets him a two count. Bubba reverses a suplex attempt to swing things back in his favour. Lex gets hung up on the bottom rope and Bubba slides out of the ring to hit an uppercut. We then see a limousine. Out comes Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and they sit on their limo as the match continues on. Bobby Heenan says that this looks like a scene from Greece. Big Bubba hits an enziguri and Bischoff calls this a back leg round kick to the back of the head. Luger's attempts at making a comeback get stopped in their tracks as Big Bubba remains in control. Nitro takes its final commercial break as we see the outsiders once again and when we come back Big Bubba kisses Lex Luger. Look I don't know what else you can say here, he brings him to the corner and he kisses him. Bischoff says that Bubba was biting his opponent here but you can't fool me, Lex Luger was just too delicious for Big Bubba. Luger begins firing back but his offensive flurry ends with a double clothesline. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall then begin approaching the ring and then we see the match finish. Jimmy Hart drops something in the ring, Luger picks it up and he hits Big Bubba. Luger then lets the referee see what Jimmy threw in the ring and the ref disqualifies Luger. Way to go Lex. The outsiders jump into the ring and Lex takes a beating. Hulk Hogan then shows up wearing the same black gear he wore when he went to the dark side while fighting the dungeon of doom. Luger takes a jackknife and Big Bubba thinks he's gained an NWO membership but the outsiders attack him too and Big Bubba gets thrown out of the ring. Mean Gene gets inside the ropes for an interview and Hulk Hogan says he wishes he would have done this two years ago. Hulk Hogan is bigger than the sport of professional wrestling and with the new blood, the outsiders, the new world order is going to rule the whole wrestling world. 
Minjin asks about the children and all the fans, young and old, who Hulk has turned his back on. Hulk says he led everyone's children down the right path, but still, the fans of wrestling booed Hulk Hogan. So in that respect, the fans can stick it, brother. The Winnie the Pooh family here were particularly disgusted by these remarks. As far as Sting goes, Sting was just a skinny little bodybuilder when he met Hogan in Venice Beach. And as soon as Sting laid eyes on Hulk, he began shaking in his boots. Guys like the Macho Man and other WCW superstars who blame Hogan for what he did need to realise that Hogan made professional wrestling. He's the greatest wrestler in the world and he'll always be bigger than the sport of professional wrestling. Mean Gene wants to know who else is going to join the NWO. Hogan says Hall and Nash are just the foundation. And as Hogan builds his army, people will need to wonder if more outsiders will join the NWO or will the wrestlers of WCW begin turning their backs on Eric Bischoff, just like Hulk Hogan. Hogan is going to the top of the ladder once again and Hogan challenges the WCW champion, The Giant, to a match at Hog Wild. If Hogan wins, he says he'll christen the WCW Championship, the NWO Championship. The Faces of Fear, Arn Anderson and the Steiners then come out to face the NWO as Nitro goes off the air. These four hunks are going to take on the Dungeon of Doom, but Tony Schiavone announces that there's a disturbance backstage. The outsiders are in the production truck and they're screwing around with the video feed. Security end up escorting Hall and Nash away, and we go back to the 8-man tag. Nitro opened up with Shivani and Zabisco announcing that the Outsiders sent in some video footage. We see Hull and Nash spying on Lex Luger and Sting. Luger gets a quote urgent phone call and this leaves Sting all alone to take a beating from the NWO. Rumours are also circulating about a fourth NWO member already joining the group. We then get the match we were supposed to see in last week's main event, the Horsemen, including Ric Flair, taking on Sting, Luger and Savage. Ric Flair's absence last week is mentioned but not explained. Zabisco says that people thought Flair joined the NWO last week but here he is, back with the Horsemen. Although the participants of the match here are the exact same as last week, except Flair has replaced Anderson, this one was again pretty good with plenty of brawling, plenty of heat between Flair and Savage also, and of course we had a botch from our main man Steve Mongo McMichael. It looked like a pretty painful botch too, but still, the match was going quite well until Jimmy Hart ran to the ring screaming and shouting. Something was going on backstage as the baby faces stopped wrestling to hear Jimmy out. Apparently, the Outsiders had launched an attack on WCW and the superstars in the ring stopped the match to go and find Hall and Nash. WCW wins the unopposed dollar point this week. They've given us a real reason to stick with Nitro here and while Duggan vs Enos was nothing special, the six man tag was pretty good even if we didn't see a true finish to the match. Jimmy Hart has rounded up the boys but he's too late. We go backstage and we see Arn Anderson has been taken out by Hall and Nash. The outsiders then take out Buff Bagwell and when Scotty Riggs comes to help, he too gets knocked out. We then get to see one of the most memorable moments of this early incarnation of the NWO when Rey Mysterio appears and he tries to jump on Kevin Nash, only for Nash to grab Mysterio and launch him like a dart into a cabin wall. Here, watch it again with sound. There's the Cruiserweight Champion, Rey Mysterio! Oh no! Hey! The Outsiders survey the damage they've just caused before hopping into their limousine. Randy Savage jumps on top of the vehicle and the limo speeds off, but the damage has been done. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall have launched a sneak attack and the complete aftermath is shown on WCW Nitro. World Championship Wrestling superstars come to the aid of Anderson, Bagwell, Riggs and Mysterio and people want answers. Woman plays it extremely well when she won't let doctors near double A in fear of hurting him further. And I don't think she's ever gotten credit for how good she was here, she makes it very believable. Sting and Luger tend to Marcus Bagwell while Eddie Guerrero and others tend to Mysterio. And then a fire truck and an ambulance shows up. 
Years later, Eric Bischoff said that the fire truck was not planned. People who were watching Nitro in the Orlando area had called emergency services because they thought it was legitimate. Have a listen. So real that residents in the surrounding Orlando area that were watching Nitro live called 911. Kevin Sullivan said, The switchboard at Disney lit up. These people produce movies. This is Disney. And they called us and said, you guys had a real wrestling match and people got hurt last night? Maybe we got something here? That's when I knew we were doing okay. I like to think that it wasn't viewers who called in the emergency services, but rather it was the king of Disney himself, Mickey Mouse. Uh, hi there, is this the police? It's me, Mickey Mouse. Say, there seems to be a disturbance in one of my theme parks. There's two big jacked up guys causing a ruckus and they're totally fucking up my property. Do you think you could come down here and sort this shit out? One of the guys looks like Razor Ramon from the WWF and he keeps saying Chico a lot. And the other big guy is kind of sexy, but he's fucking up my shit so bad that I'll have to pay Donald overtime to clean the place up. I gotta go now. Ric Flair has some women lined up outside my clubhouse, and Minnie is due home in an hour. Hurry your asses up and I'll see you real soon. Haha! <laughs> There's a lot of time spent looking at the carnage the outsiders have caused here. Mysterio screams that he saw four guys, but Eddie tells Mysterio and Alex Wright that there's only three NWO members. The commentators pick up on this, of course. And over by Arn Anderson, Mongo shouts that there's going to be some justice as Chris Benoit paces up and down. Ray is adamant that he saw four guys, we only saw two of course and that was Hall and Nash, and Shivani says that maybe Ray saw a member of staff or something like that, but Ray says that Eddie has to let people know that there were four guys. Mysterio gets his mask removed as he gets put inside the ambulance, Alex Wright is gonna accompany Ray to the hospital and I'd love to hear the conversation during that particular ride, and then tempers flare up between the Dungeon of Doom and the Horseman a little before we go back to our announce team, and Tony Schiavone apologises for what just happened. Eric Bischoff and Bobby Heenan show up to take over on commentary, but Bobby Heenan just loses it. The brain says he has a history of neck issues and he's not going to come out to commentate on a wrestling show when his health is at risk. Heenan is worried that the NWO could show up again at any moment and so he walks off the job. Bischoff asks Zabisco and Shivani to hang around as we go back to the ambulances and by this point the crowd's chanting boring. I get it too, these fans are likely on holiday and they don't like their time getting wasted. There's no in-ring action and there's no big screen setup to see what's going on. But for viewers at home, this was really, really different and it does a fantastic job of making the NWO seem extremely dangerous. There's a lot of worry and anxiety on display here and I thought it was all played really well. Sid was good, but Nitro was better. It's a point for WCW. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. On Nitro, we not only get to see the very first NWO announcement video, but we also hear the iconic NWO theme for the very first time. Hall, Nash and Hogan are talking about how NWO membership is invitation only and how the NWO is about to take over the wrestling world thanks to their power, their status and their wealth. The NWO promised more members, they could be more outsiders, they could work in the CNN building right now, everything is still a mystery. Kevin Nash and Eric Bischoff talked about these debut segments in depth and both guys said that Hulk Hogan went into these still cutting Hulkamania style promos. Nash and Hall took a break and they thought that this really wasn't going to work because Hulk was still stuck in his old ways and even Eric Bischoff agreed. With some careful editing, the production guys managed to capture Hogan in a much different light and much of Hogan's what you gonna do stuff was removed, giving us a much different version of Hulk Hogan that you gotta admit was pretty exciting to see. 
Hogan, somehow, after being such a huge babyface, was also a completely natural heel, and mixed in with the sarcasm of Hall and Nash, it just all comes together so, so well. The black and white filter and the odd camera cuts was all very deliberate too. Bischoff spoke about wanting to create a complete separation between NWO and WCW, and again, it worked really well. We'd get to see a lot of these announcements that were paid for by the New World Order, and it's pretty cool seeing the very first one here on Nitro. The Outsiders defeated Lex Luger and Sting when referee Nick Patrick turned heel. Not a bad match, but nothing great either. The NWO having their own slimy referee was a great idea, though I wish it was anyone else but Nick Patrick. Hall, Nash and Hogan are backstage in their gear, and they aren't too happy about Luger and Sting calling them out. The NWO work on their own time, and they don't answer to nobody. Scott Hall announces that the Outsiders will face Sting and Luger later tonight, so yeah, we're going to see the in-ring Nitro debut of Hall and Nash tonight in our main event. Hogan finds it funny that nobody has found out who the 4th and 5th members are of the New World Order, saying that nobody has been able to piece together the clues that they have left behind. Scott Hall then says that he'd like some birthday cake and he wants the booty man to bring it in. I'm actually surprised that he didn't walk into the locker room holding the destroyed cake, getting on his hands and knees and bestowing delicious cake on the New World Order. The Slammy Award winning Owen Hart takes on Shawn Michaels on Raw, while the Outsiders take on Sting and Lex Luger. There seems to be some chaos in the truck, but Bischoff says we're still going to see the tag team main event. The Outsiders appear from the crowd and then Lex Luger makes his entrance, but there's no Sting. The match is going to kick off with Luger all on his own, but the total package does a good job of taking care of both Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. Sting then appears from the audience and he hits a top rope clothesline on Big Sexy. Sting and Luger clean house and the outsiders take a moment to regroup. Hall and Nash try to attack their opponents from opposite sides of the ring, but it's no use. Luger takes care of Scott Hall while Sting hits a plancha on Nash. Scott Hall makes the save for his tag team partner, and all four men eventually get back in the ring and there's absolutely no control here. Sting takes a big boot before getting thrown over the top rope, but Nick Patrick doesn't call for a DQ, something that makes Eric Bischoff very suspicious. The Stinger comes back in with a double clothesline and Scott Hall takes a face crusher. Bobby Heenan wonders why there aren't any tags here and why is Nick Patrick not trying to get a little order in this matchup. Sting gets the outsiders in perfect position for a few Stinger splashes, but he misses when going for Scott Hall. Just then, the horsemen run into the ring and Scott Hall and Kevin Nash leave. Our match is over. Nick Patrick left the ring too, and Bischoff tries to explain that the horsemen ran down because of the bad officiating during the bout. Heenan says to take a good look at this, the four horsemen have actually came out to help Sting and Lex Luger. And then we see a replay that clearly shows Nick Patrick helping Scott Hall when Sting went for the Stinger splash. Mean Gene interviews Ric Flair afterwards and Flair says he doesn't like Sting and Luger, but he will play ball with his old enemies because they represent WCW. Flair says that Mongo will take care of Nash, Double A could destroy Scott Hall, and whoever the fourth and fifth man is, Chris Benoit will take both of them out. At Clash of the Champions, Flair and Hogan are going to style and profile, and Nitro comes to an end with Mean Gene promoting the Clash special this week on TBS. Not much of a wrestling match to end Nitro, but still very exciting stuff. The NWO are still being positioned as a real threat to WCW, even after gaining the World Heavyweight title. Harlem Heat vs Rick and Scott Steiner vs Sting and Luger in a WCW tag title triangle match would turn out to be a fun bout that was ruined thanks to the outsiders showing up. Scotty Steiner had the match won, but bogus referee Nick Patrick stopped the three count, pointing to Nash and Hall and feigning surprise. Mean Gene interviews Patrick afterwards and Patrick tries to explain himself, but we all know that he's a sneaky little shit.
After the promo, we get another announcement paid for by the New World Order. Hall and Nash are in Rome and they are talking smack about the giant, the booty man, Sting and Lex Luger. Kevin Nash says there was no way the booty man would ever be running with the New World Order, but the booty girl, that could be another story. The Outsiders talk about christening the WCW title to the NWO title at Hog Wild. They talk about how everyone wants to be part of the NWO. They make fun of Sting's hairdo. And Scott Hall ends the promo by telling those who want to join the NWO not to call them. Hall and Nash will reach out to potential new members when the time is right. Benoit comes in and both he and Luger take each other out with a double clothesline. The fans are on their feet hoping Luger can make the tag. Sting comes into the match and Benoit takes a baiting. A back body drop gets followed up with a face crusher. Sting then goes for the scorpion deathlock but Mongo makes the save, taking a dropkick to help out his fellow horsemen. Luger and Mongo battle on the outside while Benoit and Sting continue working inside the ring. The crowd then begins to roar as Hollywood Hogan approaches Steve McMichael. Hollywood lures Mongo around the ring where Scott Hall and Kevin Nash launch an attack. The referee calls for the bell as the NWO begin beating up everything that moves. Benoit takes the outsider's edge while Sting takes a jackknife. And then the crowd goes completely crazy as Ric Flair and Arn Anderson hit the ring and they momentarily get the upper hand on the new world order. The NWO end up getting the better of Flair and Double A by spraying their faces. Flair gets his trademark golden hair spray painted black by Hollywood Hogan. And man, people complain about NWO run-ins and I know this gets repetitive as the weeks and months go on, but it's absolute insane heat here on Monday Nitro. The ring is filling up with garbage and the crowd is going nuts. It's so loud and it's so messy and you can see Kevin Nash in particular is totally feeding off the audience. The NWO leave the ring and they approach Eric Bischoff. Bischoff runs away and the New World Order take over the commentary desk. Hulk Hogan says anything less would be too civilized. The cameras go back to the ring and it's absolute carnage. And the show ends with a replay of Ted DiBiase's tease for next week's episode of Monday Nitro. Even though the main event was nothing to write home about, the end of this week's WCW show was absolutely brilliant. The NWO are then shown emerging from their limousine but when they see the cameraman they quickly close the limo and they chase him away. Hall, Nash and Hogan are hiding someone inside that vehicle. Ron Studd then tries to launch Savage out of the ring but referee Randy Anderson jumps on the ropes and it really looks like our ref here wants the macho man's head shoved straight up. <laughs> shoved straight up his asshole. Snap into it, Randy Anderson. Stud hits a body slam instead, but he only gets a two count. Stud argues with the referee, and <laughs> this is just awful, isn't it? Stud gets thrown out of the ring, and Savage gets in his first bit of offense, a double axe handle from the top rope to the outside. Savage hits a body slam back inside the ring. We then see the elbow drop, and it's all over. Three moves of doom from the Macho Man Randy Savage. What a bad, bad match this was. No points for either show here. I'm not giving Raw points just for having interesting commentary. The Dungeon of Doom versus The Horseman then, and trying to write a script based on tag matches like this is always a nightmare, so I'll go through some high spots, or low spots as the case may be. Mongo has now main evented two Nitros in a row guys, outstanding, and lucky for us, Mongo is starting things off with Kevin Sullivan. Mongo McMichael gets taken down hard by Kevin Sullivan, and McMichael, <laughs> and as we look on, Mongo getting ready to unload. Nobody. <laughs> Glacier's number one enemy, Big Bubba, comes in and he doesn't give Mongo a chance to mess things up any further. Or so we thought. Mongo brings Bubba to the outside and he delivers an atomic drop, a move that hurts just as much inside the ring as it does on the outside. 
In Mongo, thankfully hits a back body drop with no issues, the big man wasn't having a great night here. The Barbarian and Chris Benoit traded some hard knife edge chops next and Chris hits a German suplex in the corner. And as Chris hits his diving headbutt, Bischoff announces that Sting and Luger are having some trouble backstage. We assume it's an NWO attack, but just wait and see. The crowd goes wild when Ric Flair gets tagged in. We see footage of Flair and Luger chasing Nick Patrick. Nick lures Sting and Luger towards the limousine and we see Ted DiBiase getting into the vehicle. Sting wants to commit murder so he throws a fucking rock through the window. But then it gets better. Our babyface heroes steal a police car to chase the NWO. Sting and Luger may have just saved Nitro from a complete beating from the WWF. Ming and Ric Flair are beating the hell out of each other. We all thought Ming was a hard man, but one woo from nature boy Ric Flair makes Ming back up. The nature boy then goes on a low blow spree, and then we see a cop outside. The cop is calling for backup. Manliest of men, Arn Anderson and Ming then went toe to toe, and Arn hit a DDT that didn't finish the match off. There was this dodgy looking back body drop, but still, the manliness levels were through the roof here on Monday Nitro. We go to a commercial break, and when we come back, we get treated to Kevin Sullivan and Chris Benoit beating the hell out of each other. Ming comes back into the match, and he totally shows Mongo how an atomic drop is supposed to be delivered. Poor, poor Steve McMichael. Benoit also takes a thunderous powerbomb from the Barbarian and Ric Flair tries to help out his fellow horsemen on the outside when things break down. Eventually it ends up being a story of Chris Benoit needing to make a tag. He takes a beating from all four of his opponents, but a double diving headbutt from the faces of fear give Benoit an opening. Ric Flair gets tagged in and he wipes out everyone. The match then breaks down, but Flair manages to lock in the figure four. It looks like Woman hesitates in helping Flair, but Benoit screams at her to give the assist. She locks hands with the nature boy, and Kevin Sullivan gives up. There's an argument between Benoit and Woman on the outside, but there's no time to focus on this. The New World Order have showed up, and they're also extremely outnumbered here. Three guys versus eight and somehow the NWO get the upper hand. The giant comes down to make the save, he sizes up the new world order, and then the big man delivers choke slams to Ming and the Barbarian before hugging Kevin Nash in the middle of the ring. The giant is now officially part of the new world order, and the days of the NWO being a trio are now officially over. And you know how everyone says that the NWO was best when it was just Hall, Nash and Hogan? Well, you've sat through it all just like me and there was, what, only five matches featuring the NWO in the past three months? Randy Savage hits the ring and he manages to take out Hall, Nash and the Giant, but Hulk Hogan gets the better of Savage with a low blow. The Macho Man takes a chokeslam followed by some of those incredibly brutal Hulk Hogan chair shots. Savage takes three leg drops from the Hulkster and then Hogan sprays a yellow streak down the Macho Man's back. And the NWO once again take over the commentary table before we go off the air. The Giant says that Ted DiBiase called him to talk business. The Giant flew to Florida to the home of Hulk Hogan, where the Giant saw Hulk's motorbikes and cars. In the middle of this tale, the NWO have to take care of the horsemen in the Dungeon of Doom, but the Giant's little story continues on afterwards. Hulk then interrupts the Giant, saying that the Giant can get some movie work thanks to Hulk Hogan. And then the giant tries once again to tell his story, but Hulk pushes the table down and the giant just gives up. It's absolutely hilarious. You can see the giant is pissed off too. He started and stopped and started and stopped and it just came off really bad. In short, the giant sold out to the NWO. That's all you need to know. The final point goes to Monday Nitro. The ending of the main event was very standard, but a whole lot of chaos and a whole lot of fun. Randy Savage had the giant beat in the semi-main event of the evening, but the Macho Man ended up walking into an NWO trap on the entranceway. Nick Patrick didn't say a thing, of course. Savage got dumped back into the ring, and the giant scored the pinfall win.
This War Games match was a little different. Because of the animosity between WCW and NWO, the superstars wouldn't stand around the cage, but instead they would come out from the back when it was their time to enter the match. Sting came out and it looked like he was a member of the New World Order, but if you look closely, you'd be able to tell that this wasn't the real Sting. The real Sting did come out a little later and he cleaned house. Sting then looked at Luger and he asked if that was good enough proof that he was wasn't part of the New World Order before walking out of the match. Sting walking away here was the beginning of the Crow character within World Championship Wrestling. Luger ended up submitting when the fake Sting applied a Scorpion Deathlock. The Macho Man tried to attack Hulk Hogan after the match, but he got destroyed by the NWO. Elizabeth tried to protect Savage, but she ended up getting her back spray painted. The crowd were absolutely silent as they witnessed complete domination from the New World Order, and the show goes off the air with the broadcast team getting chased away from their announce desk. Fall Brawl 1996, in my opinion, is a great show from start to end that has a great balance of in-ring action and storytelling. There's been better War Games matches in the past, but this one is still very entertaining. Things are going to get scary when Savage gets in the ring with Hollywood Hogan on pay-per-view. The NWO then show up in their limousine outside and the imposter Sting comes out wearing an NWO shirt. That's six NWO members there ladies and gentlemen and later on the seventh member will get added who will end up getting called Six. Bischoff says a little later on this very show that Kid is called Six because he's the sixth member, but maybe they were only counting active wrestlers or something? Who knows. The referee calls for the bell. Savage is about to launch the official out of the ring, but then the New World Order show up. Scott Hall, Six, Kevin Nash and Ted DiBiase begin beating down the Macho Man. And so, the NWO takeover of Monday Nitro has begun. Also, this confirms that Nash and Hall are not on WWF Raw tonight. Macho Man was warned, but he didn't listen. The NWO are here and Randy Savage is taking a beating. Savage takes an outsider's edge and we see Miss Elizabeth standing at the entranceway looking very concerned. The Macho Man then takes a jackknife and Kevin Nash says, It looks like we're taking over tonight. The Giant shows up wearing a waistcoat and holding a microphone, and the Giant introduces Hulk Hogan like Hulk was Elvis Presley. Give me a dun, 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 dun. You know what? Get rid of Jimi Hendrix. They should have just used this as Hollywood's entrance song. Dun, 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 dun. Then again, maybe not. Hollywood comes down to the ring and the Giant announces Hogan as the NWO World Heavyweight Champion. The Hulkster hits two leg drops on the Macho Man before Kevin Nash begins whipping Savage with a Slim Jim. Don't care what anybody says, that's funny. The Giant takes the Slim Jim and he begins tucking in. Hulk Hogan says he's used to the bright lights of Hollywood, but he's not used to the light shining on the Macho Man's bald head. So he's gonna do something about it. Hulk then proceeds to spray Savage's head with black spray paint before announcing that this is a complete takeover of WCW Monday Nitro. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall run to the commentary desk, but Eric Bischoff doesn't escape in time. Nash screams at Bischoff to sit down before the other NWO members surround Eric, giving poor Bischoff a serious amount of anxiety. The newest member of the NWO is then announced, Ted DiBiase security man, Vincent. Yeah, it isn't really an all elite faction now, is it? Vincent smacks Bischoff around a little before we go to commercial break. Can we take a break? Oh, no problem, man. When we come back, the NWO show off their very own race car. Kevin Nash announces that NASCAR driver Kyle Petty will be behind the wheel, and Kyle is also going to make an appearance next week on Nitro. Jim Powers and VK Wall Street make their way down to the ring for their scheduled match, but Nash and Hall decide to attack Powers while Wall Street walks back up the entranceway. The Giant then has some fun with Powers in the ring, and Randy Anderson decides that he's quitting right there and then. He's seen enough. This leads to Nick Patrick coming down, and of course Nick will be more than happy to officiate the remaining matchups. 
Hulk Hogan's doing a little vandalism backstage as the giant continues to destroy Jim Powers. And look, Hogan bumps into the Nasty Boys while there's a split screen going on. You couldn't make it up. Hulk Hogan says that Nobs and Sags have always had his back and the Hulkster wants to talk a little business. Hogan gives Nobs and Sags the key to his hotel room and the Nasty Boys decide to leave Nitro in order to wait for Hogan after the show. I'm giving this point to Nitro, I know this kind of NWO stuff would soon get repetitive, but you have to remember, this was the very first time a complete takeover of Nitro happened, it was so different from anything that we'd seen before and it made you wonder what was going to happen next. As mentioned though, this kind of thing does get repetitive eventually. Over on Nitro, Jim Duggan comes down to the ring first, but Big Ron Studd gets stopped by Hulk Hogan. Hogan asks Ron if the NWO can take this match, and Ron agrees. Even though Big Ron was playing ball, Hogan and Nash decide to attack him anyway, and Scott Hall asks the guys in the truck to play the NWO's theme song. Scott Hall then says this. Go with it, the soundtrack from your favourite adult movie, brought to you by the NWO. The Giant then announces that Jim Duggan's opponent has been changed to 6 and Nick Patrick is going to be our referee. It was supposed to be the Amazing French Canadians, no not the Quebecers, the Amazing French Canadians taking on high voltage here, but Pierre and Jacques don't seem too worried about letting Hall and Nash step in to face Kenny Chaos and fuck, what's his name? Uh, Robbie Rage, that's it. Scott Hall wins rock paper scissors so he's going to start things off and check out this bump right here. Chaos gets out of a hammerlock with a back elbow and Hall answers by smacking the shit out of Kenny. We see some of those great Scott Hall punches before Chaos takes a clothesline in the corner and the bad guy continues to punish his opponent on the mat. Kevin Nash gets tagged in and a knee strike brings Chaos down. Kenny takes more strikes in the corner and a sidewalk slam gets delivered as Nitro takes its final commercial break. We come back and Scott Hall is bringing the pain to Chaos. Nash gets tagged back in and Kenny finally makes the hot tag. Robbie Rage jumps in and he gets put right down to the mat. This is as one sided as it gets folks. Rage gets hit with snake eyes and Scott Hall does a little work behind the referee's back. Hall gets tagged in and he delivers a discus punch followed by a fall away slam. And then Hall begins toying around with Robbie Rage. Nash tags back in after a few knife edge chops from Hall and the domination just continues. High voltage gets absolutely nothing in here besides that hammerlock at the beginning of the match. Scott Hall comes in again after Nash nails a big boot and then Robbie Rage lands really awkwardly on his arm after taking a back suplex from the top rope. He definitely got hurt here because Hall signals for the end of the match and Chaos, the fresher man, gets tagged in to take the finish. You can also see Nick Patrick tending to Robbie Rage. Kevin Nash hits a jackknife powerbomb and our match comes to an end. Nitro goes off the air with the NWO bragging about how they destroyed Monday Nitro and Scott Hall ends the show by asking the Giant a very important question. <laughs> I gotta know something man, hey, An is Andre really your dad man? Andre really Sorry. your dad? <laughs> The NWO are then seen drinking in their hotel room and there's little Nick Hogan right there. Hogan says Nick's mom is happy to let him watch NWO Nitro every week. There's nothing of substance here. Nash says that Deborah McMichael wants him and it looks like Six orders a pizza. During the match the NWO appeared in the crowd and the outsiders announced that they're coming after the tag titles at Halloween Havoc. Randy Savage comes out for his match with Ric Flair but Ric doesn't make it down to the ring so we don't even have a match to end Nitro this week. Hogan and the Nasty Boys are seen talking backstage. Hogan tells Nobs and Sags to watch his back. Flair's music plays in the arena but Ric is nowhere to be seen. The NWO have jumped the Nature Boy backstage and now Savage is in a bad spot. He's all alone in the ring. Vincent is doing his absolute best to get some TV time while the NWO take care of Flair. Elizabeth is seen looking pretty scared and the giant begins going after Liz. Savage tries to rescue his ex-wife but Hogan blindsides the macho man. And so the beating begins. 
Hogan chokes Savage with a chair and when Miss Elizabeth tries to stop the Hulkster, Hogan puts his hands on her and he tells the Giant to take care of Savage. Giant tries to carry Savage up the steel steps but he slips. <laughs> he slips and Savage falls down. I'm sure Big Paul White got an earful backstage when Nitro went off the air for this one. And so Giant just throws Macho over the top rope. Hulk Hogan makes Liz watch the destruction of Randy Savage. Hulk wants to do it all by himself and so the Giant wraps his sweaty hand around Elizabeth's face and Savage takes a few leg drops. The ring begins filling up with garbage and the Hulkster spreads an outline of Savage's defeated body. It's a crime scene here on Monday Nitro. The outsiders come down to the ring as Hulk Hogan announces that he owns Miss Elizabeth. Savage isn't going to make it to Halloween Havoc. And Nitro ends with a fucking Hollywood Hogan monster truck coming out to rack the commentary table. This was brilliant. We don't see the destruction though, the engine revs up as the show fades to black. Gonna have to go with Nitro for the last point, it was just way more exciting to watch. Let's just pull out the Ming Manly meter for this one and yeah, Harlem Hater right up there is two manly dudes so we're hoping for a complete war here. Booker T and Ming start things off and Ming has no time for locking up and all that wrestling nonsense. A knee to the midsection and a club to the neck starts us off and Ming unleashes his ultra combo in the corner. Booker T is now reconsidering his life choices. The crowd stands up as Chris Benoit and Steve McMichael come out to the entranceway. And Mongo says this. this is up here against knock high the voltage. Lava lavas out of you. Chris Benoit. Did he just fucking say knock the lava lavas out of you? The action stops in the ring momentarily, but Ming remembers he has a job to do and Booker continues to take punishment. Booker manages to come back with a sidekick, but it doesn't affect Ming. A follow-up jump kick does the job though, and Stevie Ray gets tagged in. Ming takes a few shots before the barbarian comes into the match and Stevie takes a hard knife edge chop before getting drilled in the corner. The Barbarian hits a few back elbows but Stevie fires back with a kick to the face. This one has been extremely hard hitting so far as expected. The faces of fear take a time out on the outside but Stevie stays on the Barbarian when the match resumes. Booker comes back in and we see a nice jumping forearm followed by a hook kick. Harlem Heat then begin incorporating quick tags to keep the Barbarian away from his corner and it does work well. That is until Booker T goes up for a Harlem hangover and Ming stops Booker in his tracks. This allows the Barbarian to hit an insane top rope belly to belly suplex that makes the crowd and the commentators pop. Ming comes back into the match, Sherry screams at Ming to leave Booker alone but Ming shakes his hips at Harlem Heat's manager and again the crowd pops. There's no joking around with this powerbomb though and Stevie Ray is forced to break up the follow up pin attempt. Booker T took a ton of impact here. An illegal tag brings Barbarian back into the match and Booker takes a backbreaker. The faces of fear then double team Booker and Stevie Ray desperately needs to make a tag. But it doesn't happen. Actually the match doesn't properly finish because the crowd stands up in unison and they begin cheering. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash have just shown up and they're here to cause trouble. Remember it's the Outsiders versus Harlem Heat at Halloween Havoc. The match gets thrown out as Harlem Heat and the Faces of Fear square up to Hall and Nash. WCW are united here against the New World Order and the segment ends with the Outsiders backing off while Eric Bischoff pleads for Sting to come back and lead WCW against the NWO. A poor finish from Monday Nitro but the action inside the ring was way better than Raw's offering. The NWO come down to the ring on Nitro and Miss Elizabeth is there looking scared and worried. Hogan says it's NWO time brothers and the crowd loves it. Hogan starts ripping into Randy Savage as the giant shows off his sick new tattoo, NWO for life brother. Hollywood says he's been out filming his new Three Ninjas movie and that explains why he's clean shaven, thanks for the update Hulkster. And Hogan goes on to say that he can push all of Randy's buttons very easily. He can push a button to make Savage run, he can push a button to make Savage hide, and when Hogan turns his attention to the acting skills of Miss Elizabeth, Liz tries to slop the Hulkster. Hogan continues on, saying that thanks to Elizabeth, Hulk Hogan can make the macho man cry. The nasty boys then come down to the ring wearing NWO shirts. 
and it appears that Nobbs and Sags aren't too happy with the New World Order contracts that they have been given. Nobbs says there's no mentions of limousines and jets in the contract, something that was promised, and the money is too low also. Hogan wants to see his signature on the contract, but it isn't there. Hulk says because he didn't sign the contract, the Nasty Boys shouldn't be wearing NWO shirts. The rest of the New World Order then attack the Nasty Boys, officially ending Nobbs and Sag's association with the faction. Thank you, sweet Jesus. As the Nasty Boys get a spray paint job, Hogan goes back to Savage, saying that the reason the Macho Man's life fell apart was because of Hollywood Hogan. Miss Elizabeth used to dream about Hulk Hogan even before her marriage with Randy broke down, and the Hulkster is going to take Elizabeth with him to film his Three Ninjas movie. That sounds like an incredible date, doesn't it? Hulk taunts Savage by saying Elizabeth is going to be with him night and day, and the show ends with the NWO taking over the commentary desk once again. Their microphones get cut off as Nitro fades to black. Tag team action next on Nitro, the American Males vs Harlem Heat. Scotty Riggs has been out of action for a few weeks so let's see how he and Bagwell do against Booker T and Stevie Ray. The tag team belts are on the line here, but poor Nick Patrick has some trouble lifting the titles in the air before the bell rings. Stevie Ray starts off with some hard strikes to Scotty Riggs, and the American male gets choked in the corner. Not a great start for Riggs here. Scotty tries to fire back with some right hands and he manages to hit a dropkick, but a crossbody attempt gets reversed and Riggs gets drilled hard into the mat. Eric Bischoff apologises to Randy Savage for showing him that Elizabeth video last week as Bagwell gets tagged in. A double back elbow floors Stevie Ray but he gets right back up after a pin attempt and Marcus takes some punishment. Booker T comes into the match but Bagwell reverses a hip toss attempt sending Booker over the top rope. Heenan says that this should have been a disqualification and when Mike Tanay says he thinks it was Booker's momentum that sent him out of the ring, Bobby tells Tanay not to think. Back inside the ropes, Booker takes a back body drop followed by a drop kick. Nitro takes a commercial break and we come back to Buff Bagwell getting a boot up when Booker T comes charging into the corner. Bagwell's momentum gets stopped by a Booker T powerbomb and then the outsiders are seen standing in the audience. Remember, it's Harlem Heat vs Hall and Nash at Halloween Havoc. With the outsiders looking on, Booker goes to the top rope but Bagwell catches his opponent with a perfectly timed drop kick. Riggs and Stevie Ray then get tagged in and Riggs cleans house. Stevie gets hit with a double drop kick from the American males and then it all goes downhill. Riggs takes out Robert Parker on the apron and Booker T hits a jumping sidekick. Stevie Ray pins Riggs and look at this shit, Bagwell has a perfect opportunity to break the pin but he delays it and when he does run in it's hard to tell if Patrick counted the three or not, even the commentators are unsure what happened. But Harlem Heat pick up the pinfall win and yeah this looked awful. It's a shame too because the tag match itself was really good, good enough to still score Nitro the first point. Hall and Nash walk away as the segment comes to an end. Bischoff has also been saying all night that Sting is in the building but it appears we've been fooled, it's the bogus Sting who's in the arena and he's taking on JL. The NWO come out at the beginning of the match and they surround the ring. The fake Sting starts the match off with a face crusher and JL goes for a crossbody. Bogus Sting slams his opponent to the mat. After nailing a stinger splash, JL finds himself in the scorpion deathlock and then the real Sting makes his way down to the ring, wearing face paint reminiscent of James O'Barr's Crow comic book character which in 1994 was turned into a movie starring Brandon Lee. Sting hits his doppelganger with a scorpion death drop, a few elbow drops, a stinger splash and then he applies a scorpion death lock. Heenan thinks Sting has joined the NWO due to the black and white face paint. The NWO get into the ring and they applaud Sting, and Ted DiBiase tries to recruit the real Sting into the New World Order by saying the group is like a family. Kevin Nash says it's time for Sting to break on through to the other side, and Scott Hall says Sting has nothing to show for all the years he's carried WCW on his back. Hall says they brought in the imposter Sting because they knew it would get to the real Sting, and nobody knows about imposters better than Hall and Nash. I, I love this line by the way. And so Sting has a decision to make. If Sting joins the NWO, there's no stopping the takeover. 
Sting calls the bogus Sting a cheap imitation. He says you get what you pay for and the real Sting may be out of the NWO's price range. But the only thing we know for sure about Sting is that nothing's for sure. And that's it, that's the last time we're going to hear Sting talk for a very long time. Not only do we get to look forward to Hart vs Austin, but we also get to look forward to the upcoming Crow Sting vs NWO rivalry. I can't choose between the two here, I'll let you guys slug it out in the comments section, but I'm giving a point to each show. Fantastic, pivotal promos from both Raw and Nitro. Keep in mind too that the NWO think that they've just got Sting to join the group. The Outsiders defeated Harlem Heat to become the new tag team champions. Kevin Nash hit Booker T with Robert Parker's cane and Scott Hall got the pinfall win. Diamond Dallas Page continues to impress with another victory. This time it was Mike Enos who fell to the diamond cutter. And there's a few things here that we should take note of. First, Page was working as a babyface. Secondly, the crowd are completely behind him. And finally, the Outsiders came out during the match and they cheered for Dallas. Interesting stuff here, this story will unfold over the coming weeks. Diamond Dallas Page then defeated Ice Train next. Teddy Long came to the ring with Ice Train and Nick Patrick officiated the contest. There's a great spot where Dallas gets thrown on Patrick after Train kicks out of a pinfall attempt. The audience absolutely loved this. But just like last week, things got really interesting when Scott Hall and Kevin Nash again showed up during a DDP match. This time they got in the ring and attacked Page's opponent while Nick Patrick was outside tending to Dallas. The attack gave Page a chance to hit the diamond cutter and Dallas scores another win on Monday Nitro. Mean Gene Okerlund is back on Nitro and he's interviewing Diamond Dallas Page. Gene wants to know about Page's relationship with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. DDP says he doesn't need anyone's help to win matches before the Outsiders show up, offering Page a spot in the New World Order. Page is offended that he got offered this spot in the New World Order so late, feeling that Hall and Nash see him as a less important wrestler in comparison to Hogan, The Giant, Six, and even Vincent. Nash explains that the choices he and Hall made were all political. They couldn't ask Paige to join right away because they needed Hogan to truly launch a takeover. But Paige isn't buying it. DDP feels he's being courted way too late. Nash tells Paige that he doesn't get it before the segment comes to an end. Interesting stuff. Tony and Larry then give us a look at the super rad WCW website, a website that was vandalised recently, I wonder who could have done that. Hall, Nash and Six then came out to make an announcement. The NWO are going to show up at the Cable Ace Awards and soon WCW Nitro is going to become NWO Nitro. The Wolfpack then approach the commentary desk and Hall has a few words with Tony and Larry. Hall announces that the NWO's website is live right now, so let's check that out. NWOWrestling.com huh. Motherfucker. Kevin Nash then compliments Larry's dress sense and Big Sexy asks Larry if he got a cup of soup with his shirt. This makes Tony Schiavone corpse big time. Nash reminds us that the NWO got their segments on WCW Saturday night because they won war games, but they want more. In a few weeks time, Nash says that Monday Nitro becomes NWO Nitro while Hall reminds fans to tune into the Cable Ace Awards to see the new world order. As soon as Nitro comes on the air, we see that Kevin Nash and Scott Hall have destroyed everything in sight. The Nasty Boys, High Voltage, Cyclope and Galaxy, maybe better known as Damien. All these guys took part in a triple threat tag team dark match but the Outsiders came out and they attacked everybody. Hall and Nash then speak with Tony and Larry. Nash isn't too happy that Tony laughed during last week's promo. And Scott Hall wants to talk to the faces of fear. Scott says if Ming and the Barbarian want a fight, then come out of the ring and fight. Well, Ming and the Barbarian don't show up. Hall and Nash leave. The cameramen follow the outsiders. And then Hall and Nash get jumped by the faces of fear. A wild brawl takes place before we go back to Tony and Larry for our formal introduction. Larry says that Tony should have stood up for himself when Nash was giving him trouble, but Tony says he doesn't need this, he has a family at home, and Tony decides to leave the broadcast. Larry Sabisco is left all alone to do play-by-play. -play. 
Okerlund reminds us that Page turned down the NWO last week and Dallas says he's been letting the NWO do their own thing and he's hoping that they let him carry on doing his own thing. Hall, Nash, Six and the Giant then show up and Scott wants to know if Dallas has changed his mind. Kevin Nash asks DDP if he gets it yet and Page is totally confused. Six and Hall say they get it and when the Giant says the NWO should just take Page out right now, Nash says that the Giant also doesn't get it. Kevin Nash says something beautiful is going to happen tonight on Nitro before the NWO leave. Page says he works alone and that's what self high five is all about. And Mean Gene is left confused about what the New World Order are talking about. What is it that Page doesn't get and what is it that's so beautiful that's going to happen later on. We end both shows with promos, Psycho Sid gets interviewed on Raw while Eric Bischoff gets a surprise on Monday Nitro. Bischoff gets into the ring and he apologises for sucking up to Hulk Hogan earlier. Bischoff says again that he's tried his best to contact Roddy Piper but the hot rod isn't answering his calls, his faxes, this new thing called emails, but Eric promises to do everything he can to get the Hogan vs Piper match booked for a future pay per view. The bagpipes then begin playing in the arena and Bischoff looks shocked, he wasn't expecting this. Roddy Piper walks out, the hot rod gets into the ring and Piper says it's nice to be back but he's here to tell the truth. Roddy says he's honoured to be on Nitro but someone has been saying that Piper is afraid and scared and that's a lie. Piper then points to Eric Bischoff and he says that Eric's a liar. Roddy then sarcastically shakes Eric's hand and Bischoff looks like he really wants to leave the ring. Piper says that Bischoff flew to Portland, he talked to Piper's managers apparently and Bischoff visited his ranch. Piper asks if the road is straight or crooked on his ranch and Bischoff says he can't remember. So it's made clear that Eric has not been trying to contact Piper to get this match signed. As the NWO hit the ring, the hot rod lets out a naughty word. I'm sure this didn't go down well at Turner. The New World Order hold Piper down as Hulk Hogan gets in the ring and he embraces Eric Bischoff. Hogan then says that we should now realise who everyone is working for here. Hogan says Bischoff is the foundation of WCW and now he works for the NWO. Hogan says Piper is a loser, until Piper wrestled Hogan nobody knew who he was. Hogan says it's time to teach Piper a lesson and Piper tries to make a dive for Bischoff but he's held back. The ring fills up with security guards as the new world order begin leaving the ring. Once things settle down Piper says he's going to show up at world war 3 with a match contract. Bobby Heenan and Mike Tenay can't believe that Eric Bischoff has been a part of the new world order for all this time. A contract signing between Roddy Piper and Hollywood Hogan took place. Hogan wanted Piper to show everyone the scar from his hip surgery as a way to demean the hot rod. Piper ends up getting hit with a steel chair on the leg and he gets an NWO spray job. The NWO back off when Roddy flips a table and the hot rod says if that's the best Hogan can do then the Hulkster is in trouble. The Outsiders defeated the Nasty Boys and the Faces of Fear next to retain the tag team titles. Scott Hall used Jimmy Hart's megaphone on Brian Nobbs and Big Sexy followed up by hitting a jackknife. In the World War 3 Battle Royal, the Giant emerged victorious. It ended with Luger taking on Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Six and the Giant. Luger manages to eliminate Six and Hall. And when Lex put Nash in the torture rack, the Giant decided to eliminate both men to win the match. This means the Giant is in line for a WCW title match in the near future. Eric Bischoff then showed up with the New World Order. Eric explains that after he got jackknifed all the way back at the Great American Bash, he had to make a decision. Did he want to fight the NWO or did he want to be part of the group? Days after the Great American Bash, Bischoff had a meeting with Hall and Nash and after a lot of planning, the Outsiders and Bischoff consolidated their power within wrestling. So for this whole time, Eric has been working with the New World Order. Eric then says that every wrestler in the locker room has 30 days to change their WCW contracts to New World Order contracts. The NWO are now going to start truly building their dynasty. The American males then came out, Marcus Bagwell high fives a bunch of NWO guys 
and Scotty Riggs takes a neck breaker. Buff the Stuff Bagwell is now part of the New World Order. Mero vs Billy Gunn is our Raw main event, while WCW Nitro presents Harlem Heat vs The Faces of Fear. Harlem Heat completely destroy our Ming Manly meter, Booker T and Stevie Ray are not to be messed with. This is one of the most manly battles possible on WCW. We may have seen this one in the past already, but it's a shame that so little time is left on Monday Nitro. There's just under 5 minutes before the show is over. Ming and Stevie Ray start us off, and Stevie strikes first. Ming takes a little punishment before performing a super combo that gets him out of the corner, and Sherry watches on as Stevie gets choked on the ropes. Check this out, Stevie comes back with a big boot. The Barbarian then decides to hit a big boot on Stevie Ray, and then Booker T jumps in, Booker hits a jumping sidekick, and Stevie Ray lands another sidekick on Ming. I'd love to see those Nick and Matt Jackson boys just try their little super kick party inside that ring. We aren't done yet though, Booker T nails a scissors kick while Stevie Ray holds Ming, and the kicks keep coming when Barbarian runs in to break up a pin attempt. We have got Ming and Booker T inside the ropes now, and the Faces of Fear pull off their backdrop into a powerbomb sequence. Things aren't looking good for Booker and Stevie. Stevie stops the match from ending, but the Faces of Fear begin making quick tags, keeping Booker at bay with some double team moves. Ming hits a backbreaker on Booker that nearly ends the match. Ming then goes for a powerbomb, but Stevie Ray breaks the count. This leads to the Barbarian taking Stevie to the outside where a brawl breaks out. And then the inevitable run in happens. The NWO, along with new member Buff Bagwell, hit the ring and everyone gets taken out. It's absolute destruction. World War 3 winner The Giant nails Stevie Ray and Ming with choke slams, and the other guys involved in this tag match just don't stand a chance here. The show ends with the new World Order posing in the middle of the ring. Quite an underwhelming finish to Nitro this week. The NWO then show up and they take over the commentary desk. Hall, Nash and Bischoff will provide commentary for the remainder of the show. Bischoff wants to talk about Roddy Piper, and to show Piper what's going to happen to him at Starcade, Eric Bischoff decides to roll footage of the good guy red and yellow Hulk Hogan beating up Vader, obviously a current WWF superstar. We also see footage of Ric Flair and Randy Savage getting taken out, but showing Hogan taking care of Vader had to be a weak shot at the World Wrestling Federation. Bischoff and the Outsiders are excited to see Sting in tonight's main event. The NWO still thinks Sting is going to join the group as Rick and Scott get in the ring. Sting enters through the audience, holding his baseball bat. The icon gets in the ring, and Rick wants Sting to throw the bat away. Sting tosses the bat down and he turns his back to Rick, giving Rick a free shot. The dog-faced gremlin takes the free hit and Sting gets whacked. The stinger falls to the outside and the crowd are totally loving what they're seeing here. Scott Steiner throws Sting back into the ring and Rick completely pummels the icon. Steiner then goes for a body attack but Sting dodges it. And then we see the scorpion death drop. Sting then picks up the baseball bat and Scott Steiner gets in the ring. Sting moves Scott out of the way and he offers the bat to Rick. Rick goes to once again attack Sting from behind but Scott jumps in to stop his brother, and Sting then leaves the ring. The Stinger approaches the Outsiders and Bischoff at the commentary table. The NWO tells Sting they have a contract for him, but Sting just points his bat before leaving again through the audience. Nitro ends with the NWO saying Sting will join the faction eventually, and Bischoff hopes to see Roddy Piper live next week on Monday Nitro. The Nasty Boys took on the Faces of Fear next and the Outsiders appeared on the ramp during the matchup, and it ended when the Barbarian hit Brian Knobs with Jimmy Hart's megaphone. The cameras completely missed the finish. All in all, a great first 60 minutes of Nitro, WCW gets the unopposed point this week. I'm pretty happy that DDP is wrestling on the second hour of Nitro this week because it's been quite a long time since I've been able to talk about one of his matches on Reliving the War. Jared and Paige lock up, but no one gets an advantage. They go at it again and Jared manages to take Paige down before stepping on Dallas's back. Paige sees the humour in this. 
They lock up again and Jared gets brought to the corner and the crowd pops when it looks like Paige is going to give a clean break but he gets a kick in. Paige knows he's outsmarted Jared here and he plays up to it. Jared performs a headlock takedown, Paige counters with a head scissors and it looks like the friendly banter has ended as both men push each other around before locking up again. Another headlock and head scissors brings both competitors to a stalemate. Jared applies a hammer lock just before we take a commercial break and when we come back Jared is still in control until Paige pulls off a back suplex. Dallas then hits a tilt a world sidewalk slam but it only gets him a two count. Jarrett replies with an enziguri before doing a little strut and Jeff hits a swinging neckbreaker that looked pretty good. These can be hit or miss sometimes with the old fake double J. Jarrett begins using the ropes to his advantage and Dallas takes a beating. The referee has to step in a few times to tell Jeff to chill out but double J wants to hurt Paige. And when Paige finally answers with a sunset flip, Jarrett kicks out and he hits a big clothesline on the master of the diamond cutter. Jarrett nails a slingshot suplex and he follows up with a middle rope fist drop. Paige continues to kick out and Jarrett continues to get frustrated. DDP has to fight his way out of the corner and he tries to mount a comeback, but Jarrett comes right back with a face crusher and it looks like Jarrett is going to go to the next round in this US title tournament. Paige is having a tough time against Double J. Paige finds himself in a sleeper hold and this stays locked in for quite a while. DDP eventually fights out and Jarrett finds himself taking a clothesline. Again, this makes the crowd pop. Both men are now down and the referee begins his count. The competitors make it to their feet and Dallas begins laying in lefts and rights. Paige goes upstairs and he hits a diving clothesline, but Dallas ends up flying over the top rope after charging at his opponent. With Jeff in the ring all on his own, the outsiders make an appearance. Kevin Nash distracts the referee while Scott Hall hits an outsider's edge on Jarrett. Paige rolls back into the ring and pins Jarrett for the win. This was a good fun TV match and it was also much needed. Another point for WCW Nitro. Roddy Piper is back out one more time to cut a promo on Nitro while the World Wrestling Federation presents that Mankind vs Undertaker no holds barred match. I pray to god it's good. Let's stick with Nitro. The Steiner Brothers music plays in the arena and Shivani says we're going to see Rick Steiner vs Scott Norton in our main event, but out comes Roddy Piper instead. Roddy sets up a chair in the ring, the hot rod says he's tired of talking, there's going to be no main event tonight, Piper wants Hogan right now and he wants a fight. The NWO music begins playing in the arena, out comes Eric Bischoff, Piper says stop stalling, he wants Hogan right now as Bischoff makes his way down to the ring. People are throwing all sorts of shit at Eric Bischoff, the camera cuts away from EZE but when it comes back, he's absolutely drenched. Someone definitely hit their target and I'm so annoyed we didn't get to see the prize winning throw. Someone also tries to throw toilet paper at Eric and it just misses, watch in super slow mo to see how close it was. <laughs> Even Piper throws some garbage at Eric when Bischoff finally reaches his destination after what looked like a grueling journey. What's pretty strange here is that Piper doesn't try to attack Eric even after trying to do so on Nitro a few weeks back and at World War 3. Bischoff says the NWO has left the arena so Piper has nothing to worry about and Eric then admits that he tried to stop Piper from coming to WCW. Eric says he done this to protect Piper from himself. Eric goes on to say that Roddy Piper is no Hulk Hogan and that star kid, it'll be Piper who's looking up at the lights when all is said and done. Bischoff mocks Piper as he walks away but Roddy blindsides him and Eric is then held hostage as the NWO circle the ring. Kevin Green comes down to help Piper, the crowd goes insane and this is how Nitro ended. <laughs> That's bullshit isn't it? Well the WWE Network has an extended version so let's see what happened after the show. The NWO get in the ring and Piper fights them off with his chair. Double A and Mongo then come down to help Piper and Green. This is a bit weird seeing as Green had that rivalry with Mongo going on but anyway, the NWO end up getting out of harm's way. Bischoff says he wants to go home as Ted DiBiase brings him back through the curtain and the NWO stand at the entranceway as Piper hugs Arn Anderson. Six, Hall and Nash interrupt Ice Train's victory celebration and the outsiders don't want to wait until Starcade and they challenge the faces of fear to a match tonight on Monday Nitro. This is all fine and dandy except the commentary team already announced the match earlier in the show. 
Because the Outsiders are also going to battle the faces of fear at Starcade, we should fully expect a run and finish here. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, in my opinion, rank high on the Ming Manly meter. Not quite hard and heat levels, but definitely up there. It starts off with Hall and Ming battling inside the ropes while Nash fights the Barbarian on the outside. Nash manages to trip up Ming and this allows Hall to hit a clothesline. Everyone on the ground level in the audience is standing up for this one. Hall tries to finish it early but the Barbarian breaks up an outsider's edge attempt. Nash makes Barbarian pay for his sins with a big boot. The match is given absolutely no time to settle as the Dungeon of Doom's Big Bubba hits the ring. We think he's going to attack Hall and Nash, but no, Bubba goes after Ming and it's made clear that Bubba is now a member of the NWO. Kevin Sullivan and Conan hit the ring as the referee throws the match out. More Dungeon of Doom members come down to fight before the giant makes his way down the entranceway followed by Six, Wall Street, Vincent and Buff Bagwell. More WCW guys come down and we learn that Scott Norton has also joined the NWO after he attacks Ice Train before going on to attack more WCW guys inside the ring. David Sammartino is here <laughs> and for some reason he's attacking WCW guys. The crowd really pops when Sting makes an appearance. Aaron Anderson grabs Sting and the icon nails double A. This makes Steve McMichael attack the Stinger along with Rey Mysterio but Sting takes care of both men before leaving the ring. Sting didn't touch a single member of the NWO here, and the commentators are left confused by Sting's actions. The tag match was absolutely nothing to write home about, but the brawl between WCW and NWO was fantastic. We have new NWO members and the mystery of Sting continues to intrigue. It's a point for WCW Nitro. Lex Luger took on Tombstone next. Who is Tombstone? I hear no one ask. People may remember him as 911 in ECW. He had only wrestled two matches as Tombstone before changing his name to Big Al. Yep, Big Al. Not much to say here. Luger wins with the torture rack. After the bout, Lex's Starcade opponent, the Giant, shows up to attack Luger. But Lex puts the big man in the rack too and this leads to the NWO hitting the ring and the total package gets out of harm's way. After this segment, Hulk Hogan comes out to cut another promo. And Hulk says he just received a letter from Roddy Piper and the Hot Rod has admitted that Hogan is the one true icon of professional wrestling. Hogan is greater than Piper could ever be and Piper has apparently said he doesn't compare to Hollywood Hogan. Just then, Piper's theme music plays in the arena and out walks Eric Bischoff wearing a kilt and a red and yellow Hulk Hogan t-shirt. Eric must have been afraid of the audience seeing his little executive producer because he's wearing jeans under the kilt. Bischoff gets into the ring and he says, just when you thought you knew all the answers, I changed the questions, acting like Piper. Bischoff says he had no right to be in the main event with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania and there's no way in the world that he can beat Hogan. And so Roddy Bischoff here lays down in the middle of the ring and Nick Patrick makes a three count. Bischoff begins to bow down to Hogan while he and Hulk say that the Hulkster paid for Piper's home and the Hulkster feeds Piper's kids. And then a pipe band begins making their way down to the ring as Hogan and Bischoff look on in disbelief. The crowd and the commentators pop when Roddy Piper shows up on Monday Nitro and he begins approaching his Starcade opponent. There's a great atmosphere in the arena here. Piper gets into the ring and the two men begin trading punches. The NWO's Big Bubba and Wall Street hit the ring and they hold Piper. If you want anyone holding your opponent, you definitely want old diamond hands here. And as Hogan begins beating up Piper, we see Sting watching from the rafters. The crowd again chants we want Sting as security rush into the ring. The whole NWO is here now also and this is how Nitro goes off the air. Wanna know what happens next? You gotta tune into Starcade 96. Great ending to Nitro, the Steiner match could be skipped but those last moments with Piper and Hogan were excellent. There really wasn't much of a story going into our next match, the Outsiders vs the Faces of Fear. Ming and the Barbarian had failed to win the tag team titles back at World War 3 when they faced Hall and Nash and the Nasty Boys in a triple threat match. But Jimmy Hart had managed to get the Faces of Fear another tag team title shot on pay per view and well here we are. The Outsiders vs The Faces of Fear also took place just two weeks before Starcade on Monday Nitro, 
but that match ended in a giant WCW vs NWO brawl so this match should be a little more straightforward. Dodgy referee Nick Podrick is going to call this one and Kevin Nash gives him a playful pat on the ass. The competitors get checked over and our match begins with Scott Hall and Ming. The two competitors trade wrist locks and Hall tries to attack Ming's shoulder. He's successful for a little moment but Ming decides to stop the outsider with a hard clothesline. Hall takes a few chops in the corner but he manages to fight back with a bulldog as the crowd chants Razor at the former bad guy. Ming tags in the Barbarian and Hall spits on him before tagging in Big Nash. A Diesel chant then breaks out as Kevin steps into the ring looking pretty confident. Nash overpowers the Barbarian in the corner but Barbarian goes on offense at the opposite turnbuckles. Nash takes some hard chops and referee Nick Patrick steps in to break things up. Kevin takes advantage by hitting the Barbarian from behind and the commentators wonder if Nick should be getting so involved in this matchup. Ming evens the odds by hitting the ring in the faces of fear to a number on Nash. Big Sexy tries bashing his opponent's heads together but it has absolutely no effect. The Barbarian nails a sidewalk slam but his follow up elbow from the middle rope misses its target. Nash hits snake eyes and Hall attacks Barbarian a few times from the apron before getting tagged back in. The faces of fear attack Hall in the corner but it looks like Scott isn't in the mood to take any more punishment. He does a good job of fighting out but Ming continues to get in cheap shots from the apron. The distraction allows Barbarian to hit a big boot. Nick Patrick gets distracted when Barbarian goes for the pin and the commentators say that Nick's count afterwards was slow. Ming comes back in, Hall takes a pile driver but again Nick Patrick takes his sweet time in counting the pinfall and now Ming is getting annoyed, god help us all. Barbarian comes in, he hits a power bomb on Hall and even though Kevin Nash breaks the pin at 1, Patrick still took his time in making the count. It's clear that Patrick won't be counting Hall or Nash's shoulders to the mat here. An atomic drop and a big boot combination puts Hall on the mat. Patrick makes a good call here when the Barbarian, the illegal man, pins Hall afterwards but for whatever reason Barbarian is allowed to stay in the ring afterwards. The Faces of Fear had a habit of doing this where they just wouldn't bother tagging each other in during matchups. Big Nash nails Barbarian from the apron and Hall hits a jumping clothesline. Six chases Jimmy Hart out of the arena after Hart jumps on the apron and back inside the ropes Barbarian has applied a nerve hold on Hall. Nick Patrick won't raise Hall's arm or check if he's out, instead Hall is given enough time to make a comeback and Scott hits a side suplex. Hall tags in Kevin Nash and it's pretty much all over here. Ming breaks up a pin attempt but this prompts Hall to come back into the ring. All four men are fighting at this point and the crowd rise to their feet as Kevin Nash hits a jackknife powerbomb. Nick Patrick doesn't hesitate and the outsiders win this one via pinfall. Bit of a strange one this, the action inside the ring was fine but I'm sure you noticed that the outsiders were working babyface at a few points. Although to be fair, the crowd were going to cheer for Hall and Nash regardless. Scott Hall without a doubt worked the hardest during this encounter. Dallas signals for the cutter, he tries to get a corner rebound attack but he bumps into Eddie and Guerrero falls out of the ring. Scott Hall, Kevin Nash and Six then show up. And while the referee's outside with Eddie, Scott Hall nails an outsider's edge on DDP. It looks like the NWO have decided to attack Paige because Dallas turned them down. Eddie wakes up, he hits a frog splash and Eddie becomes the new United States Champion. After the bout, the NWO attack Guerrero. Eddie defends himself pretty well to begin with but the numbers are just too much. Six ends up getting in a few kicks before stealing the US title, so once again the championship belt has been stolen by the New World Order. And the crowd is almost stunned when Hogan gets knocked out. Hulk can't keep his hand raised and the referee calls for the bell. Roddy Piper defeats Hulk Hogan at WCW Starcade. Once the fans realise what happened, the place totally erupts. Piper begins to celebrate but he doesn't get a chance to truly enjoy the moment as the outsiders hit the ring. Roddy fights off Hall and Nash and he gets out of harm's way. The giant watches what happens and he has no intention of getting into the ring. Once Piper leaves, the giant also goes to leave but Hulk and the outsiders chase the big man back up the rampway. Hulk Hogan then blames the giant for the loss and Giant isn't prepared to listen to it. Giant wants to know where Hulk and the Outsiders were during his match with Lex Luger and Hulk again tells the Giant that it's his fault that Piper just won the Starcade main event. The Giant dropped the ball. 
After some arguing, the giant walks away, and Hulk Hogan goes back to the ring where he… he celebrates with the World Heavyweight title. It's a typical Hulk Hogan move here, Hollywood negates Piper's victory by saying the world title is still controlled by the New World Order, Voodoo Child plays in the arena and Hulk poses in the ring to end Starcade. Nitro starts off with the NW arriving at the arena and Hulk isn't annoyed about getting beat last night at Starcade, Hollywood is still the champion and the title is still in the NW. The Giant takes a good look at the WCW Championship as the New World Order brag about being at the top of the mountain, and finally, the big man reminds Hogan that he's in line for a title shot after winning the World War 3 Battle Royal. Hogan reminds Giant that he dropped the ball last night at Starcade, and the Giant's title shot is being used to buy the NWO some time. As long as the belt is on Hulk Hogan, then everything is cool. Giant says he wants a chance to be the lead dog as Ted DiBiase tells the cameraman to go away, so it looks like there might be a problem within the NWO. The crowd continues to chant for Roddy as Hogan wants Piper to tell the truth. Piper though isn't going to lie to the fans about what happened last night at Starcade, and the hot rod tells Hogan that Piper is now the icon. Hogan has to smell it, he has to eat it, and Piper says Hogan has to poop it. Hulk tells the fans to shut up because he has something to say about Piper's family. Hulk continues on to say that he didn't destroy Piper last night because Roddy's son asked him to go easy on his dad. This isn't news to anybody because Hogan said this at the start of the show. Anyway, this makes Piper take his jacket off. The Hot Rod then has a little trouble taking off his shirt, but it doesn't matter really. The NWO hit the ring and Piper gets taken out. More NWO members begin filling up the ring but the cameras focus on the giant. Piper gets dropped on Scott Norton's knee in a great looking spot and the ring is beginning to seriously fill up with garbage as fans show their displeasure. Hogan hits Piper's repaired hip with a steel chair and give it up for Hogan here, the chair shot didn't look all that bad. But then it came time for the giant to attack Piper and to everyone's surprise, the giant refuses to perform the choke slam. The NWO back off as it looks like the giant is actually protecting Piper, and as doctors bring a stretcher down to the ringside area to get Piper out of harm's way, Hulk Hogan says the giant has dropped the ball once again. Strike 1 was at Starcade, Strike 2 is now on Nitro, and Hogan gives Giant his third strike with a slap across the face. Giant grabs Hogan by the throat and the big man tells the NWO to leave the ring. Hogan pleads with the Giant to let him go while agreeing to give the World War 3 winner his title shot, and it looks like things have calmed down afterwards but Hogan tells the NWO to attack the Giant. Giant takes care of Bagwell, Vincent and Shit Sting but the numbers are too much and the big man takes a beating. The NWO shirt gets ripped off the Giant's back and it's made clear that he's no longer part of the group, and Hogan gets a few shots in with the world belt as the NWO keep the Giant held down. We see an ambulance take Piper out of the arena and Nitro fades to black. <laughs> 